we also have Vishwanath here today, who's who's specially come down to be with us. I, I won't keep it formal, Vishwanath, but I have to introduce you. So Vishwanath is a civil engineer and an urban planner by qualification. With Biome Trust and Biome Solutions, he pursues individual and community-based solutions to the water and waste problems of our times. He also teaches at Azim Premji University and sits on several technical committees and policy spaces with the government of Karnataka. Karnataka. His current in interests include the integration of livelihoods with rainwater harvesting, water waste reuse, wastewater reuse, and groundwater recharge. Vishwanath is is all things water and always, always engaging. So welcome, Vishwanath. Thank Thanks you. for being here. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, Jim, for that wonderful formal presentation. It's absolutely structured and so much of an architect, urban designer comes out. Now, welcome to the chaos, welcome to India, welcome to Jugaad, welcome to absolutely free flow, right? So, uh, this will go like a thunderstorm, uh, like a Pune thunderstorm, and it'll be some ideas which are there, there'll be no formal drawings, there'll be only photographs and pictures, but some exciting things that are happening on the ground and perhaps pointing the way to the future as to what uh, cities in India can be and what uh, Bangalore is doing, right? So profound quote for the evening, uh, Thursday evening, uh, those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. So possibly we will negate this thought of ours. So what is resilience? I just want to sort of draw your attention for me when I do this talk, is the ability of a system to cope with shock and bounce back, right? So shock being the climate crisis, which is confronting us, uh, the pandemic, for example, as a shock, or uh, it could be an economic shock that would come there, but basically shocks of every kind. Uh, but again, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that in India, when we talk of sustainability and resilience, we must remember that equity is at the heart of everything. What do we want to sustain? What do we want to make resilient? Unless a system is just and equitous and delivers benefits of whatever the size of the cake is to all, there's no point in holding that to be sustainable or resilient. So first, let's get the cake divided. Let's make sure that everybody has access to some water, what we call some water for all, not all water for some, and then try to look at making it resilient, right, or to make it sustainable. That's something uh, that we have to remember, and therefore, universal access to water and sanitation facilities. Universal access, everybody getting some access to water. And that universal access includes the environment, that the environment also have access to free-flowing water or enough water to keep ecological services going. Right? So that's something that I hold dear at heart, and that's what I want to show as I go along. And then there's the media discourse. There's also the discourse of think tanks. And these discourses or these narratives drive us to solutions of a particular kind. And here's the thing, for students especially, if you do not identify the problem correctly, the solutions you chase will be the wrong solutions always. Spend a heck of a lot long time in identifying the real problem, and then perhaps even a suboptimal solution will be way better off, right? So this is the discourse in the media. So what then happens is you imagine that water as a resource is scarce. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is it an ecological resource scarcity, or is, some, is it something else? For example, is it a financial scarcity? Are we investing less to manage water? For example, is it a human resource scarcity? Do we do not have enough designers? Do we do not have enough narratives or dreams or visions? Do we not, do not have uh, good implementers, good contractors, for example? Are these some of the critical issues rather than the resource itself? So something to think about. I would argue that it's the later that water as a resource is not scarce, it's our imaginations and our design abilities and our abilities to invest. That is what is scarce. So is geology destiny? Pune sits on basalt, vesicular basalt, compact basalt, 60 million years old. Determines the Sahayadris, determines what the city is. For Bangalore, it's peninsula Agnes, 3,400 million years old. What happened 3,400 million years old brought the city to 920 meters above sea level, gave us the rainfall pattern, gave us the soil, gave us the aquifers, groundwater to hold on to, and that is what we have to live with. So geology, in a strange sense, is destiny. And geology is contextual. Geology is a biome. Geology determines what a city or a habitat has to do for its own solution, right? So let's remember geology at all times 
when we do design. Because geology is also metrology, and in India, especially the monsoon is a construct of where we are located geologically, right, in, in terms of geography and uh, geology. In the case of Bangalore, it's also very interesting because the Sahyadris, or when India dis drifted away from Madagascar, the S Madagascar kept a piece of the Sahyadris called the Palghat Gap, which is now the gap in the Western Ghats at a place called Palghat in Kerala, where the, the mountains dip down to 350 feet for about 34, 35 kilometers. And for us in Bangalore, in the summer months of April and May, the monsoon winds rush in from that gap, drift up, and in the evenings, we have what is called the office rain. 5.30 sharp, it starts to rain. And people don't carry umbrellas in Bangalore, and people grumble about the rain. And there's something that we can't do as behavior change. We can't carry an umbrella or a raincoat and come back with the rains, but we hang on to those offices and curse the rain, right? But that's a geological phenomenon of the Sahyadris, 100 million years back, what's causing us trouble getting back from our offices. So some of these interesting vignettes are very good to remember because this is that April-May rain, which is the most precious rain if we harvest it in our cities, right? So what happened long back is relevant even now. And then I would like to draw your attention as architects and planners and students who are working on urban design as to something remarkable. You see this photograph by Raghurai, this young lad is diving into this Agrasen Ki Baudi in Delhi, Connaught Place, heart of Latians, Delhi, down, Back there are the apartments, and this is Agrasen Kibaudi now. The skeleton remains, the soul has gone, yet we go there and click selfies. We don't notice the missing groundwater. What happened to groundwater? If water is a scarce resource in our cities, if we have to ship it long distances, do we want to worry about groundwater below our feet? Do we want to worry about aquifers? Do we want to worry about single, double, triple basements that we put for car parking and pump out aquifers for six months, one year, throw the water out just to keep the car parked. The car, as traffic is a nuisance itself, the car parked also is a nuisance. And our bylaws, our master plans do not recognize aquifers at all. Can we think of master plans which recognize aquifers, protect aquifers? Can we think of stilted parkings, no underground basement parkings in areas where the aquifer is pronounced, where shallow aquifer groundwater is there? We were in the camp area of Pune. We spotted a well there. There were seven beautiful old open wells. I was told 200 years back, one of them was still there with water. And the notion in the camp area is that at seven or 10 feet, you get water. Can the camp area be a what, groundwater conservation zone, a groundwater heritage zone, where we protect groundwater whenever we design buildings or we develop master plans and make sure that the aquifer has good, clean quality water is used? After all, this is the place where Kataraj Lake was built by Nana Sai Peshwa and an underground tunnel brought water to Shaniwarwada. Water was scarce, but water was also made available through ingenuity. Can we recognize aquifers and protect them? Is a question that we have to answer all across urban India. And therefore, there's now at least some sort of thinking to map the aquifers and work with it, and then to integrate it with building design and master plans. Part of resilience. Groundwater is the least cost water, least energy consuming water, and least carbon emission committing water. Groundwater is something you can recharge, and groundwater is something that talks to you. It tells you the quantum of rainfall that occurred, what good you did by recharging it, what bad you did by polluting it. So it's a signaler, it's a functional unit. So let's think about aquifers when we talk of urban resilience, and let's try and include that as part of our design, right? Because when we go to our cities, we read things that our people gone before had left, inscription stones. This is one of the greatest by Ahsoka, but more basic ones. In my city, we found a lot of these inscription stones littering the neighborhoods, which we don't protect. They talk about lakes. All of those names there are lakes, built 1,100, 1,200 years ago. Lakes, which are in our parlance called tanks, human-made lakes. People threw an earthen dam across a valley and held on to water because water was scarce, and then they used the water for irrigation purpose as well as for domestic purpose. So learning from these inscription stones, learning from history, we're here at Bandarkar uh, Research Institute. This is a place where all histories captured and documented, inscription stones have been deciphered and kept there. It's time for us as urban planners and architects also to learn from these stones which talk about the history. Of these lakes, what you see is my city with three major valleys, which you see there, and those red, red portions are lakes or tanks which were human-built. 
very interesting that this city was a land of a thousand lakes. Now we are left with 210. And this is what a tank was, a catchment with the rain clouds gathered and fell, the catchment run off, and water was collected there, stored in an earthen berm, and it recharged the aquifer, which you access through open wells, right? That's the earthen dam with stone lining on the right, which held on to water. That's the water spread, scarce water in summertime, you held on to it, and you used it for one irrigation. One irrigation. If the rains were good, two irrigations, but usually for one irrigation. And then you designed the overflow wear. When the tank filled up, it overflowed. But how did you design that overflow wear? You didn't design it for your village itself. This overflow wear water went to the next lake. So the construct of the tank was a construct of continuous series of tanks and required conversations between communities upstream and downstream because upstream and downstream had to share the same waters. This is the kind of upstream downstream thinking that cities have to do now because cities can't be net natural usurpers of water. They have to think of the downstream, right? And the cultural uh, uh, issues al uh, aligned to water, a lot of them are there, a lot of them good, like the Niruganti's who were res were responsible for distributing water from these tanks and lakes. The festival of Gangamma, which was celebrated by the entire village when the tank overflowed, this was happening in my city 200 years back. This was the paddy lands below the tanks. These paddy lands are now being converted to layouts and homes and apartments and gated communities, right? These paddy lands. Paddy lands are low-lying lands with clay, rich with water and therefore have foundation problems and issues which cities will confront. But this was the land which provided opportunity for women to work, especially, and this is how it looked like. And this is Kolar, 55 kilometers away, semi-arid Kolar, where the rainfall is 700 millimeters. Uh, beats Bali, in my opinion. You don't have to go to Bali for your uh, selfies. You can get to Kolar, and luckily don't get to Kolar in rows. You know, let it be. I don't think I should name the place where I saw this photograph because urban tourism in itself is a deadly thing. And this beautiful change of seasons, paddy growing, what's happening? Water is being converted to grains and being stored in the household for consumption in years of drought, scarcity. And a whole ecosystem that evolves around it, right? Around water in a scarce semi-arid land. And the wells are full, paddy is being collected. Groundwater, crucial, is being filled up and then it's being used in years when the tank runs dry. So aquifers are full, groundwater is there. And these are not the beautiful step wells of Gujarat or Rajasthan. These are ordinary prosaic wells in farmers' fields. But look at the heritage. Look at the construction, dry stone masonry. Not a gram of lime or cement is being used. These are water heritages. And some of them remain in our cities. Can we protect them? Can we make them functional, like the Agrasen Kibaudi? Giving drinking water security, resilience. Now, there's a major government scheme called Har Ghar Nal Se Jal. Every house are tapped, 55 liters per capita per tap. Fantastic scheme will reduce the burden of women when it's implemented. All we have to worry about is the ecological resource which is needed to keep the system going. And if we make sure that that happens, then that's the best gender thing that we can do for our women in rural India and in urban India. But when the taps go dry, when the pump breaks down, when the borewell goes dry, these wells are there still with water, so you can go there and draw the water and be still resilient and water secure. For some days, let us assume. Still, how do we include these tanks and wells as part of our water planning for water resilience and for provisioning water is a crucial thing that we are not addressing now in government programs. Can we address them? Yeah. Of course, we have to think of water for animals too, right? And how do you do this? How do you keep this tank ecosystem alive? One of the things that we are working on in 21 Villages is with partners like Asha. She works in keeping all these channels going. What are these channels? The middle one is a feeder channel which brings water to the lake or tank. The side ones are the distribution channels which take water into the rice fields, right? Both these channels are important. It's not enough if you just simply desilt the tanks. You get to understand the whole system and keep the whole system working. You could do that with JCBs and tractors, or you could do it with women from the village itself, essentially Dalit women who get labor and wages in making sure that their ecosystem is clean. And that's what they're doing. They're keeping the whole uh, channels free from silt for wages, right? So the money is not going for diesel or it's not going for JCBs and therefore shipping out of the village, but it's going into the village itself. But then what happens when it comes to the city? There's a scale disruptor. As Nana Sahib Peshwa found out when Katraj Lake was done, even at that time there was water shortage in Pune because gardens upstream were taking the water from the river and there was water shortage. So even at that time, with that population, the rivers could not supply the water during 
years of drought especially, right? So you have to think as to why modern systems came into play. Modern systems came into play in Bangalore because when you had three years of drought, the thousand lakes of Bangalore could not support the city. One lakh people died. One lakh people died. We forget that. And therefore, the government had to think of a permanent solution. And they therefore went and built a dam on a river about 14 kilometers away at a place called Hesargatta and used steam engines to pump water to the city. Now there's an ecological narrative running on in our city, which somehow assumes that the old tanks and lakes, if they are rehabilitated, will be sufficient for 13 million people. They were not enough for 2 lakh people in years of consecutive drought. The monsoon cycle we've been only measuring for 200 years. If you measure monsoon cycles in 1,000 years, frequent droughts are sometimes constructs of 40 years. The Indus Valley civilization could have collapsed due to a decline in the monsoon, right? So therefore, we have to learn from the past, but also predict what will, or imagine what can happen in the future with climate crisis, right? And systems of reliability, of resilience, will look at both. We'll look at retaining what is there as local water, but we'll also look at the modern and make sure both supplement each other. This is a photograph from one of your offices of GSDA, the first borewell drilling rig which came to India. Unleashed during the Green Revolution time, technology is a crazy thing. Technology solves a problem for some time, and technology becomes the problem after some time, right? And then we start to sort it out with technology. That's the nature of the beast. It's no criticism of it, but that's the way human beings are constructed. That's the way we build technology. So then we are able to chew into the earth and go to 2,000 feet and draw water, fossil water essentially. If we want resilience, do we want to go to fossil water or do we want to go to annual renewable water? We have to move towards annual renewable water. But this is what we are. The world's largest user of groundwater, India. China and USA combined together don't use as much groundwater as India does. In my city, 400,000 bore wells pumping out 600 million liters of water every day. 400,000 bore wells at least going to a depth of 1,800 feet. Resilience. Will this be the way forward? We have to understand what we are doing, and then we have to figure it out. So what do we do? Here is the Manuwadar community, a traditional well digging community for a thousand years. These are the people who dug out tanks and lakes, who dug out wells all across India, called the Ode, the Wadders, the Wadera. From Rajasthan, they dug the Ganga Canal, the Yamuna Canal for the British, masters of earthwork, now jobless because they are bore wells. They master, uh, they're specialists in digging wells. Even now, they go from house to house, looking for old wells, cleaning them up, desilting them, disinfecting them, potassium for magnet, bleaching powder, and so on and so forth, making sure that they come back alive. What we did was work with them to make rainwater harvesting bylaws, which make it mandatory for every building to do a recharge well. And these manwaders now make recharge wells. What are recharge wells? Concrete ring wells, which go 20 feet deep to 30 feet deep three feet in diameter, one meter diameter, six to 10 meters deep, right? So they now have a job, a livelihood, and they're part of the ecological water security for the city through rainwater harvesting. So these kind of traditional livelihoods, social justice, equity, jobs for these people, about 750 to 100 well diggers get jobs. The city does rainwater harvesting, the city gets aquifer resilience and groundwater resilience. This is peculiarly Indian. Now it's not necessary that all cities have manwaders. But if your city has one, better make sure that they're part of the solution because they know where the water is. Yeah. So these are some of the things that we need to do. So they now do these recharge wells. As you can see, they're digging the pit and then lining it with precast concrete rings and making sure groundwater goes in. This is peculiar for our aquifers because these recharge wells work in our landscape, right? This is how the precast concrete rings are. This is what slides in. And in two days, a team of four can dig a well and put it in. In many wells which are recharged, water comes back then you can use it as a withdrawal well. Maybe for three months, maybe for six months. Sometimes if your luck is good and the aquifer is good for the whole year, starting is the issue. If we start, we got to about 200,000 recharge wells now. We're aiming for a million for our city. So these are some of the things that uh, we look for urban uh, water resilience. Plumbers, we have to think of them and their training and their skills and their ability to do design rainwater harvesting systems, right? Or to design water systems for wells. So that's what's happening. Filters themselves, rainwater filters have to develop, products have to come, entrepreneurs have to develop it, like this filter here. And there are now 40 filters in the market. So when you make a policy and you make a bylaw and you create a market, the market then creates the filters and creates the ecosystem to support it. Each talk to each other. 
Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, as Rohini Lekhani would put it. There has to be a compact between Samaj Sarkar and Bazaar. Samaj to do the ideation, the narrative, to drive the Sarkar to make it policy bylaws and the Bazaar to fit in the vacuum which is needed for livelihood creation and solution creation, right? So here's a gentleman who's speaking rooftop rainwater, putting it into the well, which is covered with tarpaulin. That well gives him water throughout the year. Mr. Bal Subramaniam, and so on and so forth, right? So examples like this. We need to talk stories about good examples, make sure that it gets discussed at what level, and then it's kept clean. The well we saw today had a bit of li uh, leaf litter and garbage in it. If the well was clean, it could become a showcase for the neighborhood to come take a look at and say that I can do it too. You know, those are the kind of ideas that we need to spread. Another talk. Now we move from individual uh, solutions to a slightly watershed-based solution. This is one of my favorites, Jakkur Lake, which is one of the lakes in Bangalore, one of the dying lakes in Bangalore. The water flow is like this. That's the water flow. Notice the wastewater treatment plant, the sewage treatment plant. Notice a constructed wetland. And notice the water body. It's a 50, it's one STP wetland and lake, right? That's how it goes, the sequence, the run. The wastewater treatment plant treats 15 million liters of water per day. Good quality water like that, which you see on the right. High quality treatment. Treated wastewater coming in into the wetland. The wetland receives untreated wastewater also, but also treated wastewater. The wetland is crucial to the design. The wetland is the most biologically diverse space in this water body. Water bodies are not as biologically diverse as wetlands are. So the wetland is polishing the water, but also fostering biodiversity of plants, animals, reptiles, bia, weaver, bird, name it, all of them there. So this has now become crucial to the design of lakes in Bangalore. Every lake at its entrance has a wetland, portion of it devoted to wetlands, right? That's how it looks like a three day retention time. It acts as a biofilter. It's also fodder space. What's growing in plants is also fodder for cattle. That's the treated waste water from the wetlands coming in into the water body. As you see, it's already polished to a high level. The paths, footpaths, notice that the path is not concreted or paved or anything, it's an earthen path. You've got to design ecologically. And then the fishermen are provided a livelihood because this water body now supports fish. Yeah. So fish. 250 kgs to 500 kgs of fish a day, depending on the season, depending on what water is. The wastewater treatment plants uh, generate sludge, which is fertilizer sold to farmers. So therefore, you create an ecosystem whereby nutrients are recovered and put into productive use, right? That's the fish. And that gentleman there on the right and the one on the bottom is collecting grass from the sides and from the wetland. It supports up to 250 cows. You have to allow the cattle grazer to come in, pick up the grass and take it away. It's doing a mass balance of the wetland, providing livelihood for the cows. What happens is a middle class capture and then they tag these guys with pattas and say, you can't come in. Can't bring the cow, you can't come in into the lake. Middle class have to become socially aware, <laughs> make sure that livelihoods get first preference and perhaps if the patta has to be put, it has to be put on the walkers or on the lake, not on those who are, whose livelihoods are dependent on the lake. Thinking of social equity and look at what it can support. You all know that there are many herbs, grasses, shrubs, which our local women know, know of, which go into the kitchen, which we have forgotten about, and also for cattle. So this integration of wastewater, wetlands, lakes, fisheries, fodder, food, all this has to happen in urban space if you want urban water res resilience. And then it recharges the groundwater and the wells become full. Treated wastewater is converted to drinking water without the yuck factor. Because what you're drawing water is from a well. You're not taking water from a sewage treatment plant. So if we indirectly bring sewage, treated wastewater into our drinking water cycle, through a system of formal treatment as well as informal treatment, that's the best way cities can survive. So what we need is correct functioning of the STP, make sure that it works all the time, and that you manage and collect every drop of untreated wastewater before it goes into the lake. And the fishermen are crucial, as you can see in the figure on the bottom left, in managing the water hyacinth if it comes there, because their livelihoods is dependent on it. And in terms of the contract that is worked out with them, or when the community negotiates with them, they remove what is called these macrophytes regularly, and the water body is kept clean, right? Because otherwise, these macrophytes, this water hyacinth is a big nuisance. Everybody scratches their head how to get rid of it, right? But if you get the fishermen to do it for a livelihoods perspective, then it gets done automatically. So these are some of the things, and then the pelicans come, and then the painted stocks come, and they get their Aadhaar card, their voting card. They don't leave the city. They're supposed to be migrants. They settle. 
Do we want it? Do we not want it? I don't know whether there's an invasive species issue here or not, but they're welcome, right? The painted storks. But then you have to plant the right trees for them to be able to nest there and roost there. You need trees with large branches and you want to put there. The guano is also excellent fertilizer, right? These kind of visitors are welcome, though they also may come from outside the country. And then you have a great recreational space, a beautiful aesthetic space, overflow where and culvert is designed, and then it runs off to the next lake, and if you do it the same thing in the next lake, the chain of lakes gets clean, right? So this is the attempt that is being done. And a heritage structure is retained. This well is more than 100 years old, but it's also functional. Only functionality can protect heritage long term. Otherwise, it takes a lot of money to keep heritage going, right? So how do we tie functionality and heritage is one of the crucial issues. Another of my favorite stories, Muniraju, town behind a Vijaypura, very close to Bangalore, close to the airport, 45,000 population, sewage network, no sewage treatment plant, all sewage flowing in a drain, storm water drain going to the lake, which brings the water to the town from bore wells, fouling the nest principally. Muniraju digs a bore well, 1,000 feet, six hectares of land. He's a very happy farmer. The bore well goes dry. He's a rich farmer. He becomes a laborer in other farmers' field because his bore well went dry. What does he do? Taps into the switch, untreated switch, taps into the drain, brings it to his farm, allows it to settle for two days, pumps it into his field, and grows a crop. Some of you may recognize the crop. If some of you do, shout. If you don't, it's okay. I'm not trying to shame you. Mulberry, shaitut, yeah? That's not to be eaten. That's the mulberry. And he's doing furrow irrigation, not flood irrigation, so that the farm worker doesn't have to step into the sewage, right? Not a drop of sewage now reaches the tank. Every drop of sewage is precious. Farmers fight for the sewage. They say, Monday you take, Tuesday I take, morning you take, evening I take, right? Warabandi, sharing of sewage waters. Look at this green fields, rush green throughout the year. Then they're taken and fed. To whom? The silkworms, local industry. Silkworms chomp on the mulberry leaves and certify the quality of the mulberry leaf. Silkworms are very sensitive. They die if the mulberry leaf has heavy metal or anything. They're doing a certification every day. Cocoons, further certification, beautiful, yarn, all there. Sorry, shit to silk. Now, should Muniraju pay the town for the fertilizer that the town has sent it, or should the town pay Muniraju for the switch treatment it has done for them? Who should pay for whom? Is this allowed legally? No. In our laws, you need a switch treatment plan for every town, right? But can we think of innovative partnerships between agriculture, farmers, fields, and towns where you cannot build a switch treatment plan for the next 20 years? When we don't have the money, right? In the interim, can we do these kind of partnerships? Can we make sure that there's no health risk? that there's no environmental risk. Can we work with these farmers to make sure that their livelihoods continue and they grow a non-edible crop? It's not a food crop, right? So it's not coming into the food chain. These are the kind of resilience narratives we have to build. These are trying times. So therefore, we have to look for solutions, not from theorists sitting in rooms, but from farmers, fishers, well diggers on the field. So Munaraju now becomes a rich man a rich farmer, he's able to better afford sewage treatment plants. He now rents land or buys land next to sewage drains. He says, I know how to use sewage. So he's the sewage specialist, the sanitary engineer of our times, right? So these are some of the things. And so we're also getting back to our wells and aquifers in our city. Cabin Park is a big park, 220 acres, where we've retrieved this old well, which is more than 200 years old now, 150 to 200 years old, called the Karga Bhavi. And these wells now provide water. IIM does rainwater harvesting, uses wells for its water requirement. Houses do it. So wells are coming back to life and into the narrative of the city as a provider of water as well as a taker of rainwater. Yeah. And so then you do it at scale, at a gated community scale. You make sure that a gated community bans individual bore wells, drills community wells, shares the water, but everybody recharges. That's part of resilience, communitizing the water, not privatizing it, not individualizing it, but making it as a common pool resource. How do we do it? We can do it at a gated community level because there's an association. And if the association is not fighting with each other all the time, there's a chance that you can make it work, right? Because democratic associations are also a very difficult beast to handle, as we know. 
we do have to do the maths. We have to figure out what the water balance is, what the rainfall is, what the recharge is, how much water to be drawn. And there have, we have to put a limit on water consumption by households. And that depends on the area, on the rainfall in that particular city, right? So that's how we work at gated community scale. At an apartment scale, it's good to do recharge as that one does. This is TZ, 94 villas and flats. They put in place a wastewater treatment plant, which has ozonizer and an RO system. And they drink that stuff. This is the first set of apartments in India which mimics what Singapore does. They blend water with groundwater and drink it on their own, right? That's the Pollution Control Board chairman ha taking a swig at that stuff. Some would argue that it's better with whiskey and rum, but others would argue it's good enough with RO itself, right? So we've got to figure that out. Luckily, the city itself has meters in place. Every flat now must have a meter. So you work with policy bylaws. And one of my jobs is to be doing that, pushing, sitting at the institution, making sure that it's mandatory now for every set of flats to have its own individual meters. Every house in Bangalore already has meter because of a historical accident. But if we meter it, we measure it. And if we measure it, we know how much is being consumed. And we can then control it with tariff. That's a good chance that we can do that. Bylaws and regulation also make wastewater recycling mandatory for a set of 20 apartments or more makes rainwater harvesting mandatory, and makes uh, dual plumbing mandatory, makes uh, the sump to overhead tank filling being automatic level controllers. That's also mandatory. So we need to push these policies and bylaws also as we work with, with the ecosystems that we have, right? That's what one thing. And so the last point that I want to discuss with you is how much of river water is a city entitled to? Resilience means looking at your city in a river basin. Resilience is not city navel gazing. Resilience is the city taking responsibility for the water that it consumes from a river and being responsible for the wastewater that it lets out, right? That is what the city should be looking for because the city is the economic engine which can afford to do that. It has the monies to do that. So there we are in our city, which is up on a ridge line, as I told you, 920 meters above sea level, that's the pink part of it. We pump water from 100 kilometers up. Four dams upstream of the Kaveri River hold on to water. Pune has more dams than we have. <laughs> Pune has eight dams, I heard, all very close to each other, and that provides water for us. Bangalore has four dams. But the first charge on those four dams is to the city. The water comes to a place and then is pumped up 100 kilometers and 300 meters up, making it one of the costliest waters in Asia. So there it comes to the city. Then what do we do with the water? There's something called urban metabolism. We consume the water, chuck it away as untreated wastewater most of the time, perhaps as treated wastewater, we'd leave it into the rivers close by, right, or the, river, or the lakes close by. Can we get more responsible with the wastewater? So what this city, what our city has done, with a bit of nudge from political parties, with a bit of nudge from people who have been advocating for it, is its first decentralized is sewage treatment plant. So we have 35 sewage treatment plants, not the number there. 25, 35 sewage treatment plants, and it has the capability of treating 1,400 million liters per day, whatever sewage we generate. Unfortunately, we're not able to capture all the sewage because the sewage network is not complete. It's getting there, but it's a very painful process to get that done. But whatever sewage then comes to the sewage treatment plant, which comes to these kind of plants, 35 of them, that's the sewage treatment plant, that's the raw sewage parameters there are numbers there which we don't have to worry about. We treat it to adequate standards and then start to fill up lakes in the neighboring dry land districts. Climate change affected district, drought prone affected district, seven out of 10 years is drought, but they are full of lakes or tanks. Now this treated wastewater starts to fill these lakes. You see that first lake and then it overflows from the first lake. That's the overflow from the first lake. These then become a cascade of lakes. Already about 150 lakes are being filled in Kolar district, about 100 lakes in Chikbalapur districts. Overall, the ambition is that every drop of wastewater from Bangalore will fill a thousand lakes of Kolar and Chikbalapur, making these lakes climate resilient. These lakes will now have water 365 days a year, 366 every leap year. If you forgot the leap year, that is. And that's the treated wastewater flowing. So there's a constant endeavor to improve the treatment water quality. Now the farmer has a mobile phone, a WhatsApp, and a contact to the local media. If one day there's untreated wastewater coming in, there's hangama in the assembly, there's in the media everywhere. So now there's pressure on the system to treat the wastewater to adequate quality so that it doesn't even foam. Right? And the NGT also has worked in and said that you must get phosphates less than one, you must get nitrates less than 10, BOD less than 10, parameters are increasing. The city is now going to invest 2,400 crores in improving treated wastewater. By next year, we'll have high quality treated wastewater. 
Question is, should we remove nitrates and phosphates when we are giving it for agriculture, where that's an essential component as a fertilizer? Be that as it may. So the water is now going in and filling up the lakes, and these lakes are fishery grounds. If these lakes are designed as wetlands, they become biodiversity grounds. So a thousand lakes full of biodiversity, painted storks, pelicans, the rest of the lot, right? The wells filling up, farmers are not allowed to take the water directly, they have to take it from the aquifers. The wells fill up old heritage structures. And from the wells, the farmers use rip irrigation systems and grow cucumbers, whatever the food needs. So here's what's happening. With wastewater and what's called the circular economy, 64,000 farmers' livelihoods is being protected against climate change, against drought. In turn, the food security of the city is ensured because the food they grow comes back to the city. This is how cities have to look at themselves in a hinterland. They have to look at themselves as water and fertilizer factories, right? So you fill lakes through wetlands and make the lakes come alive. You fill aquifers, you fill lakes outside the city. You recycle within apartments and drink uh, the water if you can. Harvest rainwater, use water efficient devices and so on and so forth. So resilience is a job in which citizens, communities, the state, farmers, everybody is a part of. Open wells are filled, drip irrigation comes in, farmer security is ensured, right? So, conclusion. That's the most number of words that I'm using in any slide, so please read it for yourself. This is what is called an adaptive management framework. What we have to do in India, because at the Kuznets curve, at an economic scale, we're not still formalized like the US or Europe, right? So we can't have gorgeous plans. We have to work on the sly and get things going in a direction which we want, investments going in the direction we want. So what we need till we get to the $10,000 per capita or $5 trillion economy which we are hoping to get very soon, after that we can be very formal and work on it. Till that time, we have to have an adaptive management framework and we have to be smart and we have to quickly sell our ideas and make sure that replication follows quickly. There's a significant need to train a new generation of water management practitioners, practitioners skilled in participatory system design and implementation who go away from manuals and codes and standards. Manuals and codes and standards are good for reference document, but creating visions is to step beyond that. We can't have manuals which are 70, 80 years old, which are just being renewed on a piecemeal incremental basis. We can't, we can't afford to do that now. We've got to be creative. We have to respect that. I'm not saying throw that manual away or burn it, I always say that bury it, but then look at it very seriously and say what is it that we are structured to do, right? Because Eleanor Rostrom, the Nobel Prize winning economist, tells us these 13 mantras, think about institutions. Our institutions are all 20th century institutions. We need to create 21st century institutions. Post social change as problem solving. Embrace diversity. Be specific to that particular problem. Listen to people. Farmers, well diggers, fishers, are all, these are all part of the solution, not just engineers or politicians. Self-government is possible. Everything changes. So things may be suboptimal and that's the way it's going to be. You're not going to get a golden silver bullet. Map power. Power determines what solutions are adopted. Map power, leverage power. Make a seat for yourself at the table where discussions are happening and make sure to pursue people with your ideas. Collective ownership can work. Human beings are part of nature too. Don't let us look ourselves as something different from the ecosystem. All institutions are constructed, so can be constructed differently. No panaceas. Complexity does not mean chaos, but recognize complex complexity, recognize multidisciplinarity, recognize that different kind of people have to come together. Fisheries people, agriculture people, hydrogeologists, groundwater people, well diggers, you know, engineers, all of them, architects, urban designers, all have to come together. And we have to start to listen to each other's voice, each other's language, and understand, be sympathetic, and work together. It's very difficult. Easier said than done. Because the only thing we learn from history, to leave it to Hegel, that we do not learn from history. So thank you for those, uh, for the time and those listening to it.